Dear friends, welcome to our weekly philosophical talks with Stephen Friedman. First of all, we would like to introduce Stephen Friedman. He's a great philosopher, a scientist, an artist, and also he's the New York Times acclaimed great philosopher. Thank you very much, Stephen, for joining us weekly. Also, we would like to thank the U.S. Consulate General here in Almaty, American Space Almaty, and also you, the audience, for joining us weekly. And please feel free to ask our questions, to give your feedback. We would be very happy to see them all. And also, the topic of today's talk is the philosophy of blue. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much for the introduction, Aliyah. Um, thank you for moderating the talks and facilitating them. I also want to, as you did, extend my thanks to the Consul General in El Mahdi, the U.S. Consul General, um, Dana, Elmira, and everybody involved in prevent, presenting this opportunity and making this platform available for philosophical perspectives on a wide range of contemporary issues. A lot of the talks that I give are keyed into international days, and that's the motivation for today's talk. Turns out that this week, I think earlier in the week, is was International Day for International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies. And that motivated me to give a talk about, well, a little bit about clean air, um, but concentrating primarily upon blue skies, um, their philosophical significance, and also the color blue which has played an important role in, in my work in, in the history of philosophy generally in the history of science. So with that in mind, um, I always like to indicate what initial thoughts come to me when I'm conceiving of a topic because the ideas matter, but also the sequence of ideas. When I write, aphoristic books, when I, when I publish them, I publish them largely in the form in which the aphorisms originally came to me, because that sequence provides additional information, additional insight that might help like, clarify ideas that otherwise would be more obscure. So it's additional, it's, it's, it's something also that pertains when you're investigating some historical result. If you're interested in deeply understanding, let's say Einstein's work on relativity, I find it helpful not just to see the final form in which his ideas were expressed, but to understand something of their germination, of what motivated his thinking and what helped direct it. So the first thing that came to my mind um, as it often does, is a poem by a poem and a poem by Emily Dickinson. Not, not an entire poem, but the second stanza of a poem. And the poem goes, inebriate of air am I, and debauché of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. It's, it's a poem in which she describes an ecstatic encounter, her ecstatic sense of, of nature. And one of the most important elements in that ecstatic experience is the experience of a blue sky, an overarching, being drenched in blue, molten blue. Well, um, Turns out that when I was growing up, and this intersects the, the topic of clean air, when I was growing up in Los Angeles, in the San Fernando Valley, blue skies were rare. In, in, the, you know, in, in, you know, in the preceding decades, Los Angeles and the San Fernando Valley in particular had a trenchant smog problem. It was renowned. You know, throughout the world for the intensity of its smog. It was unusual to encounter a blue sky. Typically, the skies were sort of well, hazy, brownish, um, 
maybe maybe tinged with orange. Um, and and there's in fact a and I have an image. Let me show you an image of what those skies tended to look like compared to contemporary Los Angeles, where there's been improvement in the quality of air. So let me show you this. Okay. Let's see if you can see it. On, on my left is Los Angeles bathed in smog from several decades ago, maybe the 1960s. On the right is uh, an image from 2003 or so, where you can see blue sky in the distance. That was a phenomenon that was rare decades ago. The issue of clean air, oh, there you can see it. 1968 was what I knew when I was young. 2005 is the progress that's been made in addressing you know, the, you know, uh, the, the problem of smog in Los Angeles that's, that was certainly one of the worst in the world. Now, Los Angeles smog was especially bad for a couple of reasons. For one thing, the city was dependent, still really is, on the automobile. And automobile exhausts were a major contributor to air pollution. Another factor is that Los Angeles, and in particular, the, the San Fernando Valley in which I lived, which was a little bit north of the city proper, was ringed with mountains. It was a valley. And typically, there would arise what were called air inversions. An air inversion is a circumstance where cold air, which wants to sink, is near the ground, and warm air which wants to rise is above it. So normally you would have warm air close to the ground that would tend to rise, cold air that would then sink. And that process would circulate the air and help clean out, you know, like air pollution from, from an environment. Well, when you have an inversion, the cold air is trapped beneath the, the warmer air and smog air pollution builds up within that lower layer. And that buildup is what produces the, the degree of smog that LA has suffered with and, and still does to some degree, but to a lesser degree now because of efforts at addressing the problem, ameliorating the problem. It's been a major focus of efforts. Now, when we're talking about addressing a problem, achieving a goal like clean air, like blue skies, we're in heuristic space, right? Heurist, a heuristic is something that helps us achieve a goal, solve a problem in some way. Heuristic space, as I've talked about repeatedly, is governed by convergence. And the fundamental principle of heuristic space is that any problem is solvable at some level of convergence, some order of convergence by bringing enough elements together, possibly enough elements in the right order, in the right sequence, um, in the right pattern, Patterns, orders, sequencing are also convergent elements. So in principle, everything is solvable at some order of convergence. If you have a personal goal, maybe you want to become especially fit. Well, if you do enough exercise, if you attend to your diet adequately, you get enough sleep, you regulate you know, your intake relative to the calories you're burning, over time, you lift enough weights, you go to a trainer, whatever you know, the protocol is that you adopt, normally it's going to be a multi-dimensional protocol. You're not going to do just one thing or two things. You're going to do a multiplicity of things. The more things you do, the more robust the result 
that you achieve? Well, in the case of the problem of air pollution, to achieve clean skies, to liberate a field of blue, the more we do, the better. Um, the, the problem of air pollution, as, as we experience it in cities like Los Angeles, as has been experienced in cities, well, especially in the Western world, beginning in the Industrial Revolution, early in the early 19th century, and now spreading throughout the world, is largely a product of the burning of fossil fuels by factories, by cars, by industrial processes. It's been estimated, and actually a study just came out this year by Harvard University, and I think in combination, in collaboration with some other universities, estimating that one in five deaths worldwide are due to air pollution, either to the negative effects that air pollution has on the lungs, um, the negative effects it has on the cardiovascular system. It's pernicious. It is something that is not compatible with human health over the long term. And the greater the exposure and the greater the intensity of exposure, the more vulnerable people are to untoward health consequences. So there's, there's a lot at stake in addressing the issue of clean air, not just the aesthetics of achieving a blue sky, but practical issues and, and humanitarian issues of, of, of human health. Um, so again, how does one achieve the desired result? Well, by doing as many things as possible. And if you go online, um, you can look up you know, efforts to ameliorate or efforts to improve air quality. And you'll see lots of enterprises, lots of, of innovations that people are pursuing, you know, to, to help address that problem. But, you know, the, the, less reliance upon the automobile. I live in Santa Monica. Um, Los Angeles is a city designed around a car. I, I have a car. I don't really drive my car. Um, I you know, walk about 13 kilometers a day, and I will walk every place I need to go as opposed to driving. So for me, you know, I'm making that personal accommodation um, to help address the problem. That's, and, and notice by doing walking instead of driving, not only am I you know, playing a role in, in, in addressing the problem of air pollution, but I'm also promoting my own physical health, right? So um, it's partly a matter of numbers. Right. Um, I showed you one of my poll works in which I had embedded an aphorism in, in Braille. And in one of the particular works I showed you um, had in Braille the aphorism, numbers govern contingency. Contingency is events that arise. Well, numbers govern contingency means the more of the more elements or ingredients we feed into a, an attempted solution, the more likely, likely, likely we are to achieve that solution. So if each of us, you know, adopted lifestyle changes, you know, that would place less of a burden on fossil fuel consumption, less of a burden on the environment, that's one element moving towards a solution, efforts to conserve energy, you know, in your personal life. And then obviously the exploration of alternative forms of energy to, you know, to, to replace the reliance upon fossil fuels, you know, whether those are, are wind or, or geothermal or even, even nuclear. 
you know, has the capacity to reduce our reliance upon fuels that contribute to the problem of air pollution that, again, is not just impacting human health, but is also profoundly affecting the environment, is the main contributor, at least the human contribution to global warming. So there's a lot at stake and there's a lot that each of us individually can do. And there's also a lot of collective enterprise you know, that seeks to help reduce the, the severity of the problem. Um, in, there's been a transformation in the automobile industry towards electric cars that are less polluting, dramatically less polluting. So, there's a lot of pollution that just comes from the tires of cars. So, you know, there's a lot that we can do in terms of modifying lifestyles, even modifying the design of our cities. It's, again, not a matter of a single factor, a single key, you know, to open a single lock, but many ingredients that cohere, that converge to achieve a desired result. So that's really the philosophy, right? The broader picture of how to solve a problem as, as, as trenchant, as demanding, as complex, as clean air, and ultimately global warming. But those pictures that I showed you of Los Angeles give you a sense of what is possible. Um, that was possible partly because of catalytic converters, right? um, devices that help control emissions on, on, on gasoline using cars. So just that innovation was helpful. And then there was a severe clamp down on industrial pollution, the amount of, of pollutants that factories could introduce into the so there's, there's a lot that can be done, as you see from that photographs, without introducing extremely transformative technologies. But those help too, and those are being investigated. And you know, the human mind has capacities you know, for developing technologies that can solve problems in unanticipatable ways. But again, it's a matter not of one thing, but of many. Like I told you, World War II was, was won by the Allies when lots of strategies, lots of approaches were implemented, not just one or two or three. Well, so growing up, I did not experience blue skies very often. I also actually had an interest in astronomy from, from a young age. Um, my parents bought me a telescope when I was about 11. Um, the problem was I was in the San Fernando Valley where not only did you see a brown haze, an orangish haze in the daytime, but at night stars were obscured. So, you know, I could look at the moon, I could see some bright stars, I could look at Jupiter, but I was limited in terms of what I could observe at the skies. There's a, there's a line from the books of Joshua, that narrative poem that I've quoted from in the past, um, that I've actually quoted from before, but it applies to exactly what we're talking about today, though there are a variety of interpretations of lines of poetry, mine included. It's intentional. Um, poetry is a highly convergent um, mode of writing. Lots of ideas are brought together. Um, that's what metaphors are doing. They're bringing unusual or previously unlinked ideas into association. So the line goes, a deep blue sky that we sing John high turns to orange by and by. My deep blue sky, you know, that I, I yearned to experience when I was young, because I do like the color blue, um, was often kind of a brownish orange. The, just, okay, so my experience of blue was limited. 
Um, it turns out that aside from the sky, aside from the ocean, in general, our experience of blue in nature is, is relatively rare compared to the experience of other colors. When I've mentioned that like when I prepare for these talks, I don't do research you know, per se. I want to generate the talks based upon my cumulative experience. So I've had a, t a chance over, over the years to focus upon what has been especially meaningful and, and resonates especially strongly. I don't like, like just to go and look something up that might strike me that day, but a month from now or two months from now will sort of diminish in significance. Most of the things that I quote, um, that I refer to, have been important to me for, for years. So they've stood the test of time, you know, sharing them. But I was reading just some news stories um, um, and I noticed on the page, there was a story about the science of blue. This was just a few days ago. And the article was written in relation to a book that had just been published, published I think a week or two ago, called Blue in Search of Nature's Rarest Color. So um, again, we see it in the sky when you know, when, when clean air sufficiently permits, but otherwise it's relatively rare. It's not common in foods. There's famously blueberries, but after that, not so common. There's, in the history of technology, recent technology, um, LEDs, light emitting diodes that are the key to displays on cell phones and, and computers um, have been central to a lot of computer technology, a lot of modern technology. Well, the first diodes like LEDs developed were green and red. It was a challenge to develop blue. That came late in the process. In fact, that didn't come until the early 90s. And for that work, the researchers who developed blue LED devices received a Nobel Prize. So again, there's, there's a premium associated with blue. The, the main source of blue for artists, and again, that's something that um, I identify with, right? I'm a painter. Um, historically, was lapis lazuli, a, a mineral. I'll show you, I have a picture of it. It looks like that. Actually, that looks a little bit more turquoise, but it's a deeper blue, a richer blue. It's actually the source of the original source of the pigment ultramarine blue. And again, that looks a little bit on the um, turquoise side, but imagine kind of a richer, deeper blue. One of the richest blues. It's actually my favorite blue. I use it a lot in my art. I, have, you know, I know it's hard to appreciate these poles, but um, if you look at towards the bottom, you can see some dark regions. That's actually ultramarine blue. And actually, my sleeve is a little bit close to that color. I think it's easier to appreciate that than it is the poles when I show them up. But some of the blue, the darker blues are ultramarine blue. Lapis lazuli, interestingly, um, is found primarily in Afghanistan. A few weeks ago, I gave a talk on the blame game, um, partly motivated by recent political events in Afghanistan. Well, there's a convergence. Right? It just so happens that 
one of the principal minerals um, that's a source of blue um, in a lot of processes, at least historically, is from Afghanistan, lapis lazuli. The um, ultramarine blue is something that I respond to um, emotionally, um, even more than a blue sky. And I have a, a short poem that that color inspired. Um, goes, she was sun to me, ultramarine sea, sun to me. There's a poem written about somebody who actually um, appears in my play Philaris's Bull, a very short poem, but the focus, ultramarine blue, has also been a focus of a lot of my art, again, that it's hard for me to, to show you, but um, it's a color that resonates with me. Um, in terms of, let me say a few things about just the basic physics of this. Um, our, if a, an object has a certain color, um, traditionally, the belief was that the object had that color because somehow it was generating internally in its structure that color and emitting it, releasing it. It was producing that color and that would be the color you would see. That was the view of color and color of objects until Newton. Newton was celebrated for his work in gravitation, but almost equally celebrated for his investigations into the nature of light. He used prisms to investigate white light and um, discover that white light was actually made up of a rainbow of colors. And that rainbow of colors could be brought back together and produce white light. Well, his studies with prisms and with just the, 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 the basic experiments that he did um, completely reversed our understanding of the nature of an object's color. There's a, there's a line I've quoted before from a medieval philosopher, medieval Jewish philosopher actually, Maimonides, it goes, Reverse everything you believe. You'll be closer to the truth than you are right now. Now that's a, a heuristic principle, right? It's, it's something that um, is often useful. You know, when you're investigating something, um, trying to understand something that hasn't been understood before, it's often helpful to just reverse your perspective, your approach that can provide valuable insight especially if the original approach or the approach that traditionally was pursued by people wasn't yielding results because fundamentally it wasn't correct. So reverse. Uh, it's something that I've done not as an ultimate test of truth, but as a heuristic device to help suggest possibilities. Well, Newton's work with prisms and with color um, led to the contemporary understanding of color that when you shine white light, light on an object, that object will absorb certain pigments, absorb certain wavelengths of color. Each color has a certain wavelength, but we don't need to talk about that right now. But an object will, and, and the spectrum of colors is the colors that we see in the rainbow, you know, from from blue to um, yellow to green to um, um, red, right? blue at one end, red at the other, green in the middle. Well, plants are green because they absorb colors at both ends of the spectrum. They absorb reds, they absorb blues. So what we see is not what the plant is generating, what we see is what the plant is not absorbing. 
it's absorbing red, it's absorbing blue, that leaves the middle colors of the rainbow, that leaves greens. Those are the colors that are not absorbed that we then see as the coloration of the plant. Well, if something is blue, it's because it's absorbing the other end of the rainbow towards the red end and not absorbing the blue, reflecting the blue because it's not absorbing it. So that's the process by which we fundamentally experience the color of an object. Now, when, let's see if there's something else I want to see. Hmm. Okay, when we're talking about blue in the context of our scientific understanding, we're talking about, just as when we were talking about how to achieve clean air and blue skies, we're talking heuristically, right? We've discussed on a number of occasions that science is not rigorous because controlled experimentation is not theoretically possible, not rigorously so. The only rigor is the philosophic. And that's why we don't even have to use the word philosophy. We can just talk about rigor and everything else. Well, everything else includes science. That's where we talk about believing in science, believing in scientific results. We don't talk about believing in philosophic results philosophic results operating at the limit of rigor, the limit of difference, are incontrovertible results. Past cannot guarantee the future. The future decides the past. Two is not equal to one. Those kinds of propositions. So when we're talking about like achieving a given result, we're talking heuristically. Heuristics help us achieve a given result through convergence. When we're talking about science, we're talking about something that is intimately connected with technology, with the results that it produces that allow us to benefit our lives in a variety of ways. If our physics led to the construction of bridges, that didn't support us, we'd seek a new physics. The connection between science and technology is intimate. We say that, that technological results are a criterion of a scientific claim or theory. If the science doesn't support a workable technology, we will seek a new science. Philosophy is independent of those considerations, independent of whether it's able, whether, whether a philosophical result makes us happy. Now, it turns out that at the limit of rigor, philosophical results achieve what religions aspire to, but not metaphorically, rigorously. But that just so happens to be the case. Um, but in the case of, in the case of any type of scientific understanding, it's not rigorous, it's heuristic. And I've, I think, made the point before that if the epistemic, the rigorous, the philosophically incontrovertible achieves like the highest level of religious aspiration, but not metaphorically, not in terms of faith, not in terms of belief, but in terms of an incontestable rigor. Well, juristic space, comparative space, the space in which we are comparing ourselves to other things, comparing various things, coming to conclusions that are not rigorously supportable or ultimately justifiable, that's the tragic space that we live in. That's the space in which we suffer. We can actually put forth certain like psychotherapeutic principles that if you are in a state of despair, if you are unhappy, if you are blue, 
blue has been used to signify states of just depression, despair. We talk about in, in the musical tradition, singing the blues. There's a there's an American musical tradition actually that goes back to um, the period of slavery, really, in this country, of the blues, where you are singing about your plight, you know, about the the distress or the despair or even the horror, you know, of of human circumstance. You're singing the blues. So blue is associated with that negativity. The, the artist Picasso um, began painting, became famous actually for early works that are called works of his blue period. And I didn't send Leo this image, but let me show it to you. Here's an instance of such a work the tonality is blue, and the mood is one of depression, despair, um, anguish. These are these are, are sad works, blue works, dominated by a tonality that, again, as in the blues, suggests an, a fundamental unhappiness, unsatisfactoriness of one's circumstances. Well, that's characteristic of heuristic space. If you are experiencing despair, well, you're doubting the future. You're, you're, you're presuming against the future. You're projecting your expectations from the past into the future all of which are philosophically, rigorously unjustifiable positions or claims. So philosophy, as, as we've seen before, frees us from despair, right? The past cannot guarantee the future. No matter what has happened to you in the past, the future does not have to take the same course rigorously. And the ultimate outcome of events can reverse anything from the past. I have an aphorism that I once um, gave somebody who worked um, in the art gallery that represents me, and she claims it subsequently changed her life. It freed her from that, the despair that she was experiencing. And the aphorism goes, we suffer because we think the past is fixed and controls the future. But the reality is the opposite. The past is not fixed and the future decides it. So heuristic space is a space of presumptions where we are assuming things or claiming things not rigorous, claiming things not in evidence, if you like, another way to say it. So blue and, and everything I've said so far when we're talking about a space in which we're addressing the problem of clean air, when we're talking about scientific understanding of the color blue, the Newtonian theory you know, of blue, that those are all heuristic accounts. And, and those predispose not to a rigorous representation of circumstance, but to a heuristic representation that can help us achieve certain results that we may find desirable, though we can't know in advance whether we'll be successful in applying those results to future experience. And really, anything that's different between past and future, between one side of the room and another side of the room, is sufficient to mean that what applies to one does not rigorously apply to the other. Well, there, but so at the moment, we're in the context of heuristics of blue. And I've written a couple of poems you know, about just that orientation. A lot of my lyric poetry, the short poetry, the rhyming poetry, um, not the narrative poetry, the one, the, the autobiographical poetry that maybe is helping to communicate the philosophy, but the lyric poetry Poetry similar to type of poetry Emily Dickinson wrote, for example. I was inspired by 
Emily Dickinson's form of writing poetry, um, often deals with the tragic, the, the darker aspects, the problematic aspects of life that philosophically, my, my philosophical work and my aphoristic writing within philosophy attempts to answer. So the poetic, the, the lyric is often for me, the seat of the tragic and philosophic is the response. Here are a couple of examples of that. One goes, I think I can do this by heart. It's called lies. Well, 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 you said you'd never tell. I better forget it. Um, Cause I might, okay. I'm going to read it. Um, Okay, well, 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 you said you'd never tell. It sounded too good to be true, as if I could believe in you. But now, whatever you do, don't betray one malingering clue that skies are wise to lies in cerulean blue. Now, obviously, the connection to tonight's talk is the link to blue. Um, cerulean blue is a name for color blue. It's um, something that I've used. It's not my favorite um, color blue, not like ultramarine blue. Um, it actually, though, is in the vicinity of a sky blue. And I know it's hard to appreciate colors um, when I show them, but let me hold up just a panel of cerulean blue. Maybe that could well, see, it still looks a little bit turquoise, but there, I think from that angle, I think you can get the sense that it's kind of a sky blue. I'm not quite, um, when I paint a sky blue, I use a slightly different tone than that, but still. Um, but yeah, a negative poem, right? From um, hubristic space. Now here's another one, this is actually a poem about someone that I didn't know directly, but um, someone that a friend of mine knew who um, the person that this friend knew died at a relatively young age and, and she was telling me about her death. And I have a poem in response to that. Again, we're in a tragic context. I read her poetry in that context, and there's a link to blue. That's why I'm reading it. And this I will definitely read. And it goes, Near and far as a sun-bent star, close at hand, to a whistling land. A drop of fear steals a lingering tear, praying at ease in the swaying breeze. She came as she went, heaven sent. More than me and you she knew, a sky all sadly and madly blue. So a kind of eulogy. That is, again, that realm of the blues, right? There's, there's actually a famous song from the 1960s called Love is Blue, same theme. Um, it, um, it was originally a French song, I think. Um, in an instrumental version, it became the only French song um, or the only song with a lead performer who was French um, to rise to the top of the popular music charts in the United States. It did so, I think, in 1968. It was the number one song in this country for five weeks, but in an instrumental version and one of the rare instrumental versions of any song that ever achieved that degree of popularity, Love is Blue. 
So again, within that context of blue as the blues. Now, before we leave the heuristic, before we leave the, the, the tragic aura of blue and move towards the liberation of blue skies, the epistemics of blue as they emerge philosophically, at least in my work, I want to make make a point, a philosophic point, and that is our conviction that everyone experiences blue essentially the same, that the way you see it, the way is the way your neighbor sees it, is the way I see it, is the way everyone in human society sees blue. That points to, indicates, circumscribes the power and the sense of the heuristic. So if you want to understand to what degree we are embedded within heuristic space, that philosophy in its rigor is focused on freeing us from, because it's not the ultimate rigorous reality, it's the approximate reality. Remember, any two things are approximately the same, rigorously different. And philosophy lives within that realm of rigorous difference, rigorous distinction. It's that which obviates judgment, makes it impossible for us to judge rigorously, legitimately, anyone else's circumstance. We can't know them well enough, not intimately enough. It's not enough to walk in someone's shoes. That's an approximation, an approximate similarity. It's not enough to be born into their skin. We have to be born into their skin and never have been born in ours in order to begin to assess the world from their perspective and make judgments. So from a philosophical standpoint, we cannot judge, not because of a religious commandment, but because of the rigor of our circumstance and the nature of rigor. Well, we can't enter another person's consciousness. We can't experience anyone else's experience of blue, but we are convinced it's the same. That's an illusion. And that is something that philosophy serves as a corrective. And, and the movement from the heuristic to the epistemic, from the world of tragedy to the world of, well, we use religious terms, of Eden. Of, of mystical union with God, I'm using metaphors here, of, of Buddhist enlightenment, that movement is to move beyond that heuristic claim to an epistemic incontestability. We have to recognize that no, we do not know such a thing. And, and the degree to which we think we do is the ultimate source, one way to put it, of our suffering. So, um, and it applies obviously to any color. There's um, another relevant, I think, philosophical point to make when we talk about um, colors, color blue, um, among others. I've made the point and it comes from the work of Wittgenstein. It's probably the single most important result of Wittgenstein's work that the meaning of a word is its use, not the object for which the word stands. Up until Wittgenstein, that was the conviction, that was the understanding of everyone inside and outside of philosophy, that the meaning of a word was the object, that the word was labeling. Well, obviously, um, 
If that's the case, then the blind, the blind from birth would not be able to use color, language. They would not know the meaning of a color word. But the simple fact of the matter is they can use such words. They do use such words. And the reason they can and do is precisely because the meaning of a word is its use, not the object for which it stands. Now that's something that I'll probably develop a little bit more in another talk, but I wanted to make that point as well, philosophically, about the nature and experience and understanding of color as a concept, of blue as a concept. Okay, now let's see. Okay. Um, when I was young, when I was a teenager, we, my parents were planning a trip to England. And when we were there, I was going to go off with some cousins who were older um, to the continent and take a road trip through countries like France and Switzerland, Austria, Italy. It would have been my first encounter with the European continent and those countries. I'd been to England before because my mother and her family was English. And so we went every few years when I was, when I was young. But that would have been the time, this trip I'm describing, when I was old enough to go you know, on a road trip with cousins, not with my parents present when I was mid-teens or so, like 16 or so. Um, but, and, and obviously it was an extraordinary opportunity and, and there was fundamental interest, you know, in seeing those countries and experiencing those cultures. I was studying Fran French in high school, so I knew a little bit of the language. Um, it would have been my first experience visiting a country where English wasn't the native language. But my orientation at that time was really highly philosophical, right, as you kind of gathered. And, and in particular, I was studying the work of, of Kant, a great German philosopher. I have an image of Kant, I think, um, to show. Um, the 18th century German philosopher who was born in the German city of Konigsberg. This chin, that image, there's a portrait of Kant, Immanuel Kant, considered one of the greatest philosophers in history, um, the highest order of philosophical intelligence and achievement. Well, Kant was born in Konigsberg, Germany, and spent his entire life within 40 miles of his birthplace. Here you see the portrait. I understood that perfectly well. <laughs> My interest at that time, I'd been reading philosophy for a number of years. Um, I was immersed in his writings. I was not interested in tourism. I was not interested in a cursory, a, a, in, in sort of a, a, a superficial exploration of an environment. What I would say to myself in those days, as I considered whether or not I really wanted to go on that trip was, no, I'm not fundamentally interested in visiting those countries so much as I'm interested in understanding the nature of the color blue. And that's something that can be investigated right here from where I sit or stand. I don't need to travel a quarter of the way around the world. It will not help in that endeavor. It wasn't necessary for Kant to travel more than 40 miles from his birthplace in order to achieve among the most profound philosophical results in human history. It's a matter of looking in, not out. There's, there are legends of Zen monks, um, Eastern ascetics who will spend years or decades staring at a patch of color, a patch of blue, a spot of blue, 
year after year after year until finally they discover in that contemplation the nature of enlightenment, the nature of experience. And, and there's a reason for that philosophical relationship to that type of experience, not the experience of the tourist, but the experience of someone contemplating what's immediately before our eyes. To understand that is to understand the world. It's, there's some aphorisms that go, Eden, each point is unique and the center of things. Our world, epistemologically, each point is unique and the center of things. It's, it's part of the philosophical enterprise to understand the nature of what presents itself right here, right now. I've um, emphasized that the epistemic is the world first viewed. It's, it's the world that we're experiencing, not with the eyes of the past and not with the eyes of expectation for what's to come, but with eyes of immediacy. And, and that basically means if we are seeing familiar objects, if we are seeing things we can name or describe, we're seeing the past projecting into the present and the future. We're seeing the heuristic. Epistemic space is strange and beautiful and new. And it's revealed here and now. If we are attentive and if we can move away from the conceptual space through which we're viewing the world and see it again as if we were seeing it for the very first time. And to see it for the very first time is not to be able to name anything. As if, again, if you were to open your eyes to the world for the very first time, you wouldn't be able to name anything. You wouldn't have the past experience to project onto what you're seeing. So, my, now I did go on that trip and I did, you know, encounter you know, foreign cultures for the first time. And it has benefits, but for me, ultimately, the philosophical imperative makes such a trip, well, supernumerary, more than is necessary for the main goal of achieving philosophic understanding. Okay, the movement into the philosophic significance, the epistemic, right, the really the rigorous significance of, of blue was actually articulated by my father. Um, my father was, and I, I think I've mentioned this before, was not a highly educated man, but he was, he was a good man, a decent man, a man of character, and a man of strong intuition and, and, and a high sense of standards about, about the world, about people. But he, his formal education ended in, in our high school. He never went to college. Um, he entered um, the army um, um, near the outbreak of World War II. Uh, and, and he worked in my grandfather's dress factory. Um, he himself was um, a skilled um, worker in, in my grandfather's factory. Um, well, Towards the end of his life, I, I would visit him on a regular basis. My parents lived nearby. I'm an only child. They were the most important like, human presence in my life. I'm also, I was also an introverted only child. So I was only fundamentally comfortable around my parents. Those were the only people that I could be in the presence of and not feel compelled to talk. So 
And in fact, it was my pleasure to be with them. They would engage in conversation with each other and I would be lost in my thoughts. Right? Well, but I shared my work with my father, with my mother as well, but um, my, my mother actually suffered a brain aneurysm um, later in her life, and so she had suffered some, some cognitive deficits. So um, as my work developed, I mostly shared it with my father. And, and again, he had no philosophic background at all. Um, and no real academic background. But one day, I went into the den of his apartment where he would watch television, and I read some new aphorisms that I had written. This was um, a little over 20 years ago, shortly before his death. And I finished, and and again, I would just read the aphorisms. I wouldn't, you know, so much explain them, just read them to, you know, so we could hear the sound of them. And if you had any questions, you would ask me. One day, I read some aphorisms, and his response was, Stephen, I can't claim to understand your philosophical writings, but when I hear your words, I see blue skies and fresh fields. That's the deepest characterization of my philosophical work that I've ever heard. It goes to the essence of it, because what he was describing was the landscape of Eden, and that's what the philosophy is attempting to give fundamental logic of. He was describing the landscape of Eden. The philosophy gives the, well, I have some aphorisms. Um, Eden is a landscape of philosophical rigor. It's philosophy elaborates what the Incon the incontrovertible, incontestable, what cannot possibly be denied. And that's the fundamental condition of Eden. So my father's characterization of my work actually went to the core of the philosophy and what it was attempting, but still attempts to achieve. I talked about that actually in the eulogy I gave um, for him some months later. And, and I noted that that is the, the deepest understanding, not just of my work, but that I've almost ever heard of anyone's work by anybody. It went right to the core. And my, um, my stepmother said that, you know, that's the title of the book that you'll write explaining the philosophy to the world, Blue Skies, Fresh Fields. I haven't quite written that book. I, I, I have maybe a version of it, but um, that's still something that I'm planning. The, the sense of, of Eden as oh, characterized by, by the freshness of, of blue skies and, and green fields is, is something, and, and remember, it's the world seen with new eyes, the world seen for the very first time. It's something that I have a poem about, so here's a lyric poem that is not operating within the tragic space, it's operating within the philosophic space, and that's unusual for my lyric poetry, but still, let me share it. It goes like this. It's, 
entitled Odd. And remember, we're talking about the world first viewed. And what's that? What's the characterization of the world first viewed? Strange and beautiful and new. So, it was odd as green, the first ever seen. Strange as blue, the day it was new. Clear to the ear, when sound was a seer. Bright as the night, stars first took to light. Rare as the air, before eyes glimpsed care. Sweet to repeat, when Eden was fair. So, there is a lyric poetry set within the epistemic, or at least oriented towards it. An aphorism that I actually close Phalaris's bull with um, in a series of aphorisms that come at the end to give you know, people a sense of what the aphoristic writing is like goes, blues, greens, aquamarines. Who could have imagined? And we're talking about that same experience of blue as a characterization of, of the perfection of Eden. Because of my interest in blue skies and fresh fields um, as a characterization of, of a sense of the freshness, the, the primacy of Eden, um, the metaphor of Eden, and I'm using this metaphorically, right? Um, but I think it's a rich metaphor that I, I go back to you know, on many occasions. One of the ways that I've been communicating the philosophy, not so much recently, but um, about a decade ago or so, was through environmental works, where since the philosophical writing takes the form of aphorisms, highly concentrated expressions, they can be published anywhere, right? Um, so, one of the main environments in which I published aphorisms and short books of aphorisms was the sky. I did sky writing and what a, what a, a sky book. Um, the main process that was used in some of these works is something called sky typing, where five planes will fly through the sky in formation, basically producing letters in a dot, like dot matrix pattern, printing basically the book in the sky. Now, the first such work I did was over in New York City. And I think you can see it right there. Um, that was actually centered on Central Park. It was done in 2001. It was done two months before 9-11 before the catastrophe of 9-11. Um, the aphorisms that were sky typed were one, God plays dice in Eden. Two, presume and suffer. Three, the future is freedom. That first aphorism in particular, God plays dice in Eden, um, is actually a response to something that Einstein wrote. Um, Einstein famously commented, God does not play dice with the universe. His idea was that nothing was random, that um, even though quantum mechanics suggested a certain randomness, that ultimately everything was determined by God. He's not playing dice with things. Well, I've written in various places that in a world, in a world of time where you cannot know that something is not good because you can't know its ultimate outcome, well, that's equivalent to a perfectly perfect world, I wrote, an Eden where every possibility, every outcome is good. And so in Eden, where all the possibilities are equivalently good, yes, God can in fact play dice. And my claim is, so that's what is 
behind the thinking of that aphorism. So that was my first sky typing. Um, if you look, you can see that the letters of the words are puffs of smoke dots, effectively, um, in the sky, forming the words. They are effectively typed in the sky. After that, I did some more conventional sky writing in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, the sky writing is a very concentrated aphorism, Eden. Two is not equal to one. That's the fundamental condition of rigorous space, that two things are not one, that within heuristic space, any two things are approximately the same, but rigorously different. That's the nature of the epistemic. So two is not equal to one is short for two points are not one. That's the fundamental logical condition, one can say, of Eden. And I have an explanation for that, a little bit lengthier explanation from one of my websites. And I'm going to read that. This I did not send. So I'm going to just read this explanation of that aphorism that was sky written over Los Angeles, actually on two separate occasions, um, once over kind of central Los Angeles and once over the beach area, um, actually not far from where I live now in Santa Monica. Um, and let me read you the explanation of it as it appears on my website. It's a concentrated explanation. Um, and in fact, this was once prepared as one page of a two-page book. So again, I have a, a tendency to work towards high concentration right, in my writings. So E, two is not equal to one. The solution to the problem of human suffering is existence. That two points in any conceptual space Two objects with identical properties are distinguishable, because of which we cannot perfectly control an experiment and cannot validate a conclusion except in the oversimplifications of our mind. And so science is aesthetics and heuristics. It's logic, a theoretical impossibility. We can do controlled experiments mentally, not physically, so as to say, we suffer, not existentially, but in thought. The point of individuation is salvation. So I know that's something that probably could be discussed, maybe in a future talk. I'll elaborate more on that, make it more clear, because it is somewhat concentrated. Some of the main features of that, the impossibility of controlled experimentation, given the nature of our world, the nature of our circumstances, is something that I have discussed, but I'll discuss it again at some point, too. That was the L.A. skywriting. And then, about 10 years after that, I did a complete skybook. Um, eight aphorisms in a, in a book um, that was sky typed over Huntington Beach. Um, I have a poster of it, that's the poster. Um, and I'm go let, me read, let me read you um, what the aphorisms are that were typed in the sky. The entire project took about 45 minutes. It was one of the lar longest sky typing projects ever done. Um, it was filmed, and I have a film of it. It's actually on one of my websites, um, Skybook Film, uh, that shows the entire process of the sky typing of that work, and I accompany it to music. I'm going to play maybe a, a minute of it, um, but first let me read the aphorisms um, that were sky typed. And because I know it's hard to read from what you're looking at now, um, the the aphorisms read, first of all, the title of the book is Proving God in Worlds from Even to Odd. Now, one of the things true of these aphoristic books is that they rhyme, okay? There are a 
couple of hundred of them. They're all designed to be done in some environmental way, um, in the sky, in the water, on the sand, in buildings, in different contexts. Um, this one was done in the sky. Um, and the entire book reads, um, so title, Proving God in Worlds from Even to Odd. One, God is an epistemic. Two, God's reason is tautologic. Now, three is actually relates to a formula. I'll give it to you and I'll explain it some other time. A, B, and A colon C lives epistemology. Four, epistemics obviate controls. Five, futures predicate souls. Six, trees of knowledge die in time. Seven, salvation shadows certainty's mind. Eight, now as then, again and again, God vanishes in Eden. So concentrated, I, I read that to you just so you can hear the sound of it, but I also want to show you just a little bit of what the sky book looks like. So let me, let me go back here. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you this. You can hear it, and maybe you can see that. I'm holding it up. Okay, now I don't know if you could see that, but basically each letter goes up individually as the words are formed, five planes flying in formation. And, and that entire text was then set to music. So, and it's a 30 minute film. And again, it's, it's on that website, um, my main website, thebooksofjoshua.com. Um, and I can talk to you maybe next time about exactly where to find it. If you want to see the entire book or get a better sense of it. Okay. Um, there's one more book that I planned to do and still plan to do. It hasn't been done yet. It's called the Torture Sky Book, not because it's about torture, but because it's meant to be a response a philosophical response to extreme suffering. In other words, it's meant to be a complete philosophical response to the worst of human experience. That's what philosophy hopes to address satisfactorily. That's what religions aspire to address adequately. Well, the Torture Sky book is designed to be done over a city in five consecutive days of sky riding. The entire book consists of 42 aphorisms. They're concentrated, unusually concentrated, because for the purpose of sky riding, it's better that things be as short as possible, right? Because they dissipate quickly in the sky. So some of these, the aphorisms in the book are from other writings, but I squeezed them, concentrated them down even more. The, the, the idea is that each day there would be a different pattern in which the sky writing would be put into the sky. Um, and let me, let me indicate a little, give you a sense of this. Um, so I don't know if you can see this well, but there are different patterns for each day, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, spirals and concentric circles and figure eight patterns. Um, 
but we might see it. Yes, so there you can see the patterns. It might be a little bit hard, um, but again, one day it's, it's a spiral starting from the inside and going out, another day from the outside going in, you know, in the other case, it's concentric circles and so on, different patterns in the sky. And each day has, oh, you know, six or eight or so aphorisms. And let me read a few, I think we have some time and I will end with this. So, um, actually, it's a little, God, this is hard for me to read here. Um, hold on. Okay, uh, day one. I'll just read through these kind of quickly so you get the feel for it. Day one, one. And maybe I'm gonna read without the numbers. Life is dream if one day we awaken. We ride the world growing young. Tomorrow decides today. Ecstasies displace confidences. Objects are riddles. Meaning is generality. Generality images futurity. Time's logic, not passage, heals. And, and it goes on. I think maybe it's enough to give you a sense of that. Um, and I'll just read you from maybe the final day, um, just so you see how it closes. Um, the final day, number 36, day five, if we exist, we exist forever. 37, judgments approximate needs. 38, reality is expectational logic. 39, monotonic, monotonic worlds are silent. 40, Singularity is transcendent, 41. Singular souls unravel worlds, 42. Two is not equal to one is equal to zero. And that's a summary from another direction. So you see how concentrated the aphorisms are meant to be. Um, they're concentrated because they're meant to be written in the sky over five consecutive days as the torture sky. Okay, so with that, I think you get a sense of my motivation for talking about blue, blue skies. Um, and, and again, the aphorism that summarizes as much as any is one that I've already given, blues, greens, aquamarines, who could have imagined? That's our world, if we just see it clearly enough. Okay, now, I had a question from last time that I want to address. It's a question actually that I'm excited to address um, because it's about something that the Japanese writer Yukio Mishima um, wrote in, actually, I think it's his final work. It's from um, a work of his, an autobiographical essay, um, a long essay, Sun and Steel. Now, Mishima is considered one of the great writers of the 20th century and one of the great Japanese writers of the 20th century, but his stature was international. When I was in college, one of my roommates was actually an East Asian studies major focused on Japan. He was studying Japanese, um, he would eventually um, after graduation, go to Japan, live in Japan, teach at a university in Tokyo for many years. He did his senior thesis, if I remember correctly, on Mishima. Um, if he didn't do his senior thesis, he certainly was devoted to his writings for a period of time. Um, so I was exposed to Mishima um, partly through my roommate, actually largely through my roommate. The quotation that I was asked to address, and let me read the question here, is, address this quotation, please. Quote, the most appropriate type of daily life for me was a day-by-day -day world destruction. Peace was the most difficult and abnormal state to live in. Okay. Um, Mishima began his career as a writer but he felt that there was a, a kind of a weakness 
associated with that type of enterprise, that he admired the man of action. He was linked in, in his mind and his spirit to the, the warrior tradition, the samurai tradition of Japan. Now, he was of age to fight in World War II, but, but he didn't. And I think that seemed to have haunted him. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked, or a month or so ago, I talked about Hiroshima and Nagasaki in one of my talks. Um, and one of the things I didn't stress for that talk was that the belief during World War II was that strategic bombing you know, could not win a war. Right? That, was what the, that was the lesson of Dresden, the lesson of all the bombings of cities in Germany, the lesson of um, the Battle of Britain and the, 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 blitz, um, the blitz of, of London, the effort to bomb cities of countries mercilessly to break the will of the people to fight and support the war effort. Well, that never happened. Um, towards the end of World War II in Japan, the United States had firebombed 67 Japanese cities, including Tokyo, effectively reducing them to ash. The Japanese were not likely or seemingly not at the point of surrender. What precipitated the surrender, quite honestly, was the atomic bombing. And it was intended to do that. And it was intended to do that through an extremity of horror, that the horror of those bombs was a magnitude beyond anything that conventional bombs could achieve. And with the ending of World War II, the Japanese culture transformed. It had been a warrior culture, a samurai culture. Suddenly, after the war, now partly, I guess, through um, the, the oversight of the United States and you know, government in the years after the war. But ultimately, it transformed from a, a warrior culture to a culture of technology and gadgets and, and cuteness, right? Aesthetics um, of a certain type. Um, one component in that transformation was the horror of the war, and in particular, the horror of those bombs. Well, Mishima rebelled against that. Mishima, towards the end of his life in the 1960s, wanted to resurrect that warrior culture. He wanted to, to return Japanese, the Japanese culture to the spirit of the samurai. Well, he actually devoted the last part of his life to, to bodybuilding, physical fitness, training, making himself into a physical specimen that would be worthy you know, of that sort of future he saw for Japan, the, the future of the man of action embodying that warrior spirit. He ended up committing suicide. But what he hoped to do was to stimulate a, 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 a reawakening of that warrior spirit, that samurai spirit, you know, by his death. He was interested in, in this, the destruction of the Japan that had developed after the war and the embrace of that warlike spirit that's really committed right, to fighting, committed to conflict, committed to destruction of a certain type. It didn't happen, right? But Mishima was, was obsessed with that, with, with the direction that Japan had taken after the war and with the unsatisfactoriness of the spirit that he saw manifested in that Japanese society that had emerged from the ashes of the war. He hoped to resurrect that earlier fighting spirit, warrior spirit. And a warrior spirit, I mean, 
it's almost unfortunate. This is something I mentioned to my roommate. It's almost unfortunate that Mishima didn't have an encounter with like my vision of philosophy, which is a uh, a weaponizing of philosophy. But I have an aphorism. Preeminently, philosophy is a weapon. It kills on behalf of the meaning of the world. In other words, it destroys everything provisional, everything that's not incontrovertible, because only the incontrovertible can save us. Only the incontrovertible achieves that full representation of the rigorous reality. So maybe if Mishmet had more of that sense of the philosophic, that his energies might have been inclined to embrace that direction of, of a weaponizing as opposed to something that was more physically destructive. Okay, I think that sums up today's talk. I don't know if, do we have any questions? Um, so far, we don't have any questions, but dear friends, you're always welcome to send your questions afterwards in the comments box. And first of all, one more time, we would like to thank our amazing speaker, Stephen Friedman. Thank you very much for joining us quickly, for preparing the talks, the quotes, the pictures, the videos. They're very entertaining. And thank you, the audience, for joining us weekly. We see all your feedback. We see the thumbs up. Thank you very much. Please stay safe, join us next week, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and thank you very much, Abia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great day.